Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Walter Cronkite School of Journalism and Mass Communication and tonight's featured event, Attacks on the Press, Leaked Prosecutions, and Digital Surveillance, a panel discussion uh, by the Committee to Protect Journalists and sponsored by our friends at Bloomberg News. Uh, for all of our students here, don't get spoiled. We're not going to have that at every event. Um, but I, uh, and that is from our friends at Bloomberg. We very much uh, appreciate it. I know our hardworking students very much appreciate it. Um, Jennifer Oldham from Br Bloomberg News is going to moderate tonight's panel with Jeff King from the Committee to Protect Journalists and our own Len Downey Jr., who is the former executive editor of the Washington Post, who now holds the Weill Professor of Journalism here at the Cronkite School. For 30 years, the Committee to Protect Journalists has reported on assaults on the press and press freedoms in places like China and Iran and Syria and other countries that are typically associated with government re regimes that are hostile to the press and, uh, and press freedoms. Last year, the committee did something that it's never done before. It investigated a country and a government that it's never investigated before, and that was the United States. And it asked Len Downey to lead that investigation, and that led to a report that was released in October, the Obama administration and the press, leak investigations and surveillance in post 9-11 America. If you have not had a chance to read that, I would very much encourage you to do so. It is on both the CPJ site and the Cronkite School site. That report, that report, along with another CPJ investigation from earlier this year that looked at threats to press freedoms and the flow of information around the world will be the topic of tonight's conversation. And please allow me to introduce Magnus Ag, Advocacy and Communications Officer at the, communication, at the Committee to Protect Journalists, who will be introducing our panel tonight. Thanks, uh, Chris, and uh, thanks, ASU, for hosting us. We're really excited to be here, and uh, thanks to Bloomberg for sponsoring the event and the, the nice food and for helping us publish this book that is, as Chris mentioned, the starting point for the night. We've given this book out every year since 1986, I believe, documenting press freedom violations around the world, focusing on a bunch of different topics, changes a little every year. Now it's a book form with essays. It's also available online. Most of the essays are online, and there's a lot of data, so I would encourage you to go online and, and look at the trends and numbers for, for different countries around the world. It's kind of special for, for the Committee to Protect Journalists to be here at the, at the Cronkite School. For, I don't know if you know, but uh, Walter Cronkite was actually an honorary co-chair at CPJ and in, in, instrumental in uh, the founding of the organization. It really helped a lot in the early days to put uh, Cronkite's name on our letterhead and send that out to uh, governments wherever they might imprison journalists or harass journalists some, somehow. I want to talk too much. I want to introduce the panel. They're going to focus, as, uh, as Chris mentioned, on developments here in the US with the NSA, with the Obama administration's prosecution of leakers. The book covers a lot more. It covers everything from uh, Beijing's influence over Hong Kong and Taiwanese media to um, the positive news in sub-Saharan Africa to Syrian journalists and the dangers they face covering that conflict. So I encourage you to, to read the book. But uh, tonight's event is what's going on right here in the, in the USA. And for that, we have uh, Len Downey. As uh, Chris just mentioned, you all know him. He's a professor here and, uh, and uh, executive editor, former executive editor at Washington Post and now is uh, the vice president. And it was been great to work with, uh, with Len on that report that Chris mentioned. It was really a big thing for the organization to publish that report and to look, have a close look at what's going on in the, in the US. And I'm very excited to, to have Len here and to have him update us on what's happened since. Next to him is uh, Jeff King, who runs our internet advocacy program. It's a relatively new program the organization added because so much of journalism is going online, going online and happening online. Jeff is, uh, is leading that, those efforts and has an essay in this book on what the NSA surveillance does to, to journalists and their ability to protect their sources. Finally, uh, Jennifer Oldham is uh, Bloomberg's Cor Colorado correspondent and will moderate the debate. The hashtag, as you can see, is uh, attacks on press, so please use that, tweet away. We'll have uh, people tweeting. And then I'll kick it over to, uh, to Jennifer to start the panel. Thank you. Welcome. 
Hopefully I'm doing this right. <laughs> Thanks for being here today. So we're going to start off today with asking Len and Jeff just to summarize their work for you so you can have an idea of, of what we're talking about. Okay. Uh, I, I'll set the stage for what Jeff is going to talk about, uh, about like electronic things. Uh, I was asked to do this report for the Committee to Protect Journalists because while President Obama had promised as a candidate and promised during his early time in office and actually took steps, issued executive orders, to create the most open administration in American history. And I'm afraid pretty much the opposite has happened. I've not lived through the entire history of American administrations, despite my advanced age. But I can tell you that uh, I'm, I'm glad that uh, we have somebody here who will laugh at my jokes. Um, uh, I can tell you, <laughs> I can tell you that this is the most closed administration, American administration, uh, since the Nixon administration, and I was one of the editors who worked on the Watergate story. That is not a conclusion that the administration likes to hear me state, but it's definitely what I found in working on this report. I interviewed dozens of Washington journalists. I interviewed um, uh, many of the people who are in organizations in Washington who focus on government transparency, uh, and I interviewed government officials, including officials in the White House to do this report. Uh, it is more difficult than ever, I've, I've concluded, to report on, uh, on the federal, how the federal government works, especially about national security, uh, in order to hold it accountable to the American people. Part of the problem is that more government information is classified than ever before. That obviously didn't begin with the Obama administration, but has continued during the Obama administration. The president's promises to, de to, de to reduce classification have not been kept. Uh, Bart Gelman, the reporter at the Washington Post, who's been writing about the uh, uh, documents uh, uh, supplied uh, by uh, Edward Snowden about the NSA surveillance, uh, said in a recent appearance, almost everything you want to write about if you are writing about diplomacy or intelligence or defense is now classified. Everything but the press releases and the news conferences is classified. And then the administration has been uh, uh, using all it, every lever it has to crack down on government officials who would dare transmit classified information to the press <clears throat> and even in cases where it's not classified information more vigorously than we've, than we've seen ever before. Uh, FOIA requests are routinely being denied on national security grounds more frequently than ever before. Suspected leakers, leaks of information by government employees are routinely and vigorously investigated by government agencies, including the frequent use of lie detector tests and the scrutiny of employees' telephones and email records. An insider threat program, that's what it's called, insider threat program, has been implemented at the president's order in every single government department, and that program requires that all federal employees keep, uh, must help to prevent unauthorized disclosures of information by monitoring the behavior of their colleagues. It's Orwellian, uh, that, that, that program that's now been set up in every government agency. And then worst of all, or most threatening of all, six government employees, uh, including uh, an NSA employee, Thomas Drake, a former CIA officer named Jeffrey Sterling, uh, an Army private, Chelsea Manning, a former FBI uh, bomb technician, Donald Satch Satchelon, uh, and two government contractors, including Edward Snowden, uh, have been prosecuted since uh, 2009, that's eight prosecutions total, under the 1917 Espionage Act, which in the 90 years before the, the Obama administration had only been used for three prosecutions in the United States, and there have already been eight during the uh, Obama administration. And in most cases, it's for allegedly giving classified information to the press. Uh, in cases involving the New York Times, Fox News, ABC News, uh, the Washington Post, The Guardian of Britain, and many other news organizations. And in the case of uh, uh, former CIA officer Jeffrey Sterling, New York Times reporter James Risen was subpoenaed to testify as to who his source was, in other words, to testify against Jeffrey Sterling. Uh, and he refused. He refused to break the oath that he made to his source, whom he's not named, to break the oath to his source to keep his identity confidential. And as a result, it's now gone up into a circuit court of appeals that has held that this subpoena should still be enforced, in which case he's promised to go to prison. The leading, one of the leading national security reporters for one of the leading American 
uh, news organizations may wind up in jail for not disclosing a confidential source. And by the way, the last appellate court decision about this uh, uh, said its reasoning was that Risen was inextricably involved in a crime when he was accepting information from this confidential source. Very threatening to the media. In another case involving an employee named Stephen Wu Kim, actually he was a contractor named Stephen Wu Kim, the Justice Department secretly subpoenaed and seized the phone records and, and email records of all of his contacts with another reporter named James Rosen of Fox News. And the affidavit in support of that secret subpoena declared that, and I'm going to quote, there is probable cause that the reporter has committed a violation, close quote, of the Espionage Act, open quote, at the very least as an aider, a better, and or conspirator, close quote, for seeking information about what the government was doing in the names of Americans. And in, in another case, the Justice Department secretly subpoenaed and seized the records of 20 Associated Press Washington Bureau phone lines and switchboards for two months of, of 2012 when they suspected that a, that a government employee had given information to an AP reporter and they didn't know who it was. <clears throat> that, that, that subpoena and, and seizure of records covered many thousands of phone calls involving more than 100 Associated Press journalists using telephones in their news bureau, their home phones, and their mobile phones to do their reporting on hundreds of stories. A very, very intrusive uh, intrusion into uh, the activities of the news media. And later it did identify who the leaker was, and he's been, he later pleaded guilty to unlawfully disclosing national defense information in that case. Part of, the, part of the problem with this was, from the point of view of the press, was that the Justice Department's had guidelines that have lasted for decades uh, that cover when reporters could be subpoenaed for confidential sources or for, uh, to name confidential sources or turn records over to the government. News organizations, according to those guidelines, are supposed to be notified in advance so they can fight the subpoena in court. They can say this is too broad in the case of AP, obviously, uh, and, uh, and, and, uh, and fight the subpoena or work out an arrangement with the government that protects their news gathering abilities and yet can, can satisfy uh, the government's need in the case. Because the other part, another part of the guidelines says you should only subpoena the media at all if all other ways of trying to find the information don't work. During the time that I ran the Washington Post, there were a number of times in which when the government indicated it wanted to subpoena records or a reporter, we were able to work out a situation where we did not have to turn over what they wanted, and yet they were able to go on and prosecute their case by other means. That was not done in this case. As a result, uh, the media got up in arms. Uh, surprisingly, it didn't happen sooner, but the media got up in arms, and last summer, uh, the uh, uh, Attorney General Holder announced revisions to the Justice Department guidelines to somewhat narrow the circumstances under which federal investigators could subpoena journalists or seize their communications, and, and specifically said that reporters doing their jobs could not be uh, subject to criminal prosecution as appeared to be the threat in the uh, case involving Fox News. Uh, the, these, uh, and these followed negotiations with lawyers and uh, journalists from a number of media organizations, including the Washington Post. And they're now due to be put in the Federal Register soon, but there still is a huge exemption for national security, uh, which you could probably still conduct all the prosecutions and all the activities they did before, except perhaps for the prior notification of the news organization. Uh, and so news organizations are still concerned about the <clears throat> language in the revised guidelines and are still trying to negotiate further with the Justice Department. And the Justice Department, despite all kinds of urging and filing of friends of the court briefs and so on by the news media, continues to pursue the rise in subpoena <clears throat> through the appeal process that probably will wind up in the Supreme Court. So as a result of all this, Washington reporters told me repeatedly that more and more government officials are afraid to talk to them uh, than ever before. This has had a clear chilling effect on journalism that could make it much more difficult, is making it much more difficult <clears throat> to do the kind of reporting that would hold the government accountable. And that's before we found out about the NSA surveillance. Hmm. Um, so Lynn and I didn't plan this, but there is a, uh, a quote from um, Mario Savio. I'm glad you Use the word levers. Um, he, he said, uh, at the height of the free speech movement at Berkeley, where I teach and where I sort of got my start as a journalist and as an advocate, uh, eventually as a lawyer. Uh, 
Yes, I was back in the 1960s. <laughs> no, Mario Savio, um, back in 1964, December of 1964, um, said that there comes a time <clears throat> when the operation of the machine becomes so odious, makes you so sick at heart that you can't take part, you can't even passively take part, and you have to throw your body upon the gears and the wheels and the levers and all the apparatus. I have to say to the people who run it, the people who own it, that... Um, it's got to stop, I paraphrase. Um, and a lesser known part of that quote is he then says, uh, as a, a very uh, strong appeal to nonviolence, and says that this is more about uh, not participating in uh, this sort of grinding machine. Um, I want to talk about uh, sort of riffing off of the idea of these levers, what these levers are, what these gears are, in terms of the national security apparatus, and how they're turned on journalists and how they can be turned on journalists and eventually, hopefully by the end of tonight, encourage everybody to um, take steps to protect their sources, to protect the free flow of information, uh, and to work towards essentially a free speech movement of our own, um, toward transparency uh, and toward uh, a government um, that still respects the role of the press as an independent watchdog. So let me talk a little bit about those, those mechanisms. Uh, probably because uh, it's classified. Last year, the uh, National Security Agency uh, opened a facility in Bluffdale, Utah, um, not so far from my, my base for CPJ in San Francisco, not so far from here. And the Bluffdale facility is meant to be uh, it's actually been described by an NSA uh, employee as the NSA's cloud. It's there to hold information um, for the rest of the NSA, which has facilities uh, across the United States and all over the world. Uh, the Bluffdale facility is 1.5 million square feet with at least 100,000 square feet of space for servers and other storage, essentially. Um, based on current technology, what we can deduce is that it can probably hold, on the conservative end, about three exabytes of data. On the higher end, about 12 exabytes. What's an exabyte? Uh, it, it's, very, it's a very large number that's hard to wrap your head around, um, but there have been estimates that five exabytes are about the equivalent amount of information uh, as the entire sum of human conversations since the dawn of humankind until 2003. So that's about five exabytes. Uh, so three exabytes would be a portion of that, and, um, and uh, 12 would be many, many more times that. Um, that is one facility that was just built by the NSA. Um, again, it's classified, it's hard to confirm these things. There's a certain amount of careful conjecture that goes into reporting on these things. Um, but in reporting on them, I spoke with former NSA whistleblowers. Um, <laughs> I, I was joking, from my home office, so I'm sure there are little red flags going up um, uh, whenever I do that. Uh, and then um, uh, attorneys who are suing the NSA uh, and, and journalists who've written about the NSA and, um, and up and coming journalists as well. Um, Cindy Cohen, the uh, legal director of the Electronic Frontier Foundation, has called this a time machine that the NSA is trying to build. But on top of that, the capabilities of a data pool that large are not just in the present, but they're essentially a primordial ooze on which artificial intelligence systems, whether they've been developed already or they're in development, and we do know that uh, from the reporting of Jim Bamford that they, uh, the NSA certainly has worked on this, but basically, uh, even in the future, we'll be able to, to feed off of these massive data pools of your and my information and get smarter. Use it as a breeding ground, as a testing ground, as food. Um, and so that's the other part of this, is that it'll actually potentially accelerate uh, the sort of externalities that we see now um, and which are already starting to show themselves as problematic. So that's kind of the introduction. I want to give a preview of the sort of things I want to touch upon. Um, the first thing is, very briefly, the idea that metadata is somehow not a big deal is false. 
uh, and we can get into that in as much detail as you want. That is just not true. Uh, it's preposterous. Um, the second point is this is not just about the NSA. Obviously, the NSA is perhaps the most powerful and capable uh, agency um, with the most powerful and capable technologies when it comes to these things, but it's not just the NSA, it's, it's the FBI. It's not just the FBI, it's foreign governments. It's not just foreign governments, it's non-state actors. These things trickle down, and they're eventually going to trickle down to petty dictators, uh, trickle down to intelligence services, um, technologies will trickle down to uh, even police on the beat. Um, and depending on what you're covering as a journalist, all of that can affect you. Um, so metadata uh, is a big deal. This isn't just about the NSA. Um, and the other big point that I want to make is that it's now your and my responsibility to protect and serve our sources and our work. Um, you know, hopefully there will be policy changes. We've seen some moves toward that. Uh, we saw a fairly strident report come out of the White House Review Group that I think maybe was more robust, at least, than was expected. Uh, but in the meantime, and taking into account that there are many, many actors who are gaining access to all sorts of technologies that, on the one hand, these technologies, from a journalist's point of view, are in essence, the greatest thing since the printing press for the empowerment of the free flow of information, but they're also potentially one of the greatest tools of social control ever devised by humans. And so it's not just gonna be about the US government, no matter how much we are able to push back in the, in the sort of civic realm, um, there'll be many, many other actors who will have these capabilities, and so we have to learn how to protect ourselves and our sources. And I should add quickly, if I can, that um, <clears throat> when I talk to uh, journalists after the NSA uh, first revelations of NSA surveillance, when I ask them, does that affect your relationship with sources, they said absolutely. Because nobody knows what it is that the NSA may be finding out about the communications between sources and journalists. So on top of what government officials already knew about how they were being monitored by their own administration, to then imagine that they may also be monitored, the communications may be monitored by the NSA in a variety of ways, uh, further chilled uh, their, their relationships with journalists. So given this very tight control that we're seeing now under the Obama administration with the access to information, coupled with the surveillance, potential surveillance of sources, what sort of tools do the journalists of tomorrow and the journalists of today need to arm themselves with to gain greater access to information and then to also ensure that they're protecting their sources? Uh, I'll, I'll start with the low-tech stuff. Uh, I, you know, anybody who's seen all the president's men saw the meetings in underground garages. That, that sort of thing is being revived. Uh, in-person contact, in-person, surreptitious in-person contact. Uh, some national security reporters literally arrange to meet their sources at cocktail parties and receptions in Washington uh, so that they don't even have to meet at some other location where they might be monitored. Uh, 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 being careful what kinds of phones you use or what you say in your telephones, uh, encrypting your emails, uh, your email traffic, uh, a whole variety of things. It, uh, also, uh, storing your notes uh, in computers that are not connected to the internet so that somebody can't swoop through the internet into your computer and see what's going on in your computer. Uh, if some news organizations have set up uh, complete safe rooms, uh, you know, well-locked safe rooms that contain the, all the computer equipment they need to be handling things like the Snowden documents or other kinds of confidential information uh, in ways that are completely disconnected from the internet and can't even be accessed by other members of the news organization. The BBC is training many of its journalists in a whole variety of sophisticated ways uh, to, uh, to conduct uh, communications with sources uh, that would evade surveillance. Uh, and I think we'll begin to see more of that kind of training in the United States as well. Yeah, as my friend Tom Peel put it, we're back to red flags and flower pots, as it were. Um, let me just depress you further. Face-to-face uh, <laughs> -face meetings, what about GPS? You have a phone, GPS can be tracked. Um, Snail mail. Well, it turns out that the US Postal Service is logging uh, the outside, it's called a mail cover, 
logging the outside of all all parcels, all mail that's sent to the United States, um, as reported by the New York Times. So um, I wouldn't. Uh, I would be. I would just caution not necessarily going to things that, um, by virtue of being low tech, uh, are they're not necessarily safe. Um, and I think it, it requires sort of um, the most important thing is figuring out what your threat model is, right? So for most journalists, so for Bart Gelman, uh, for Laura Poitras, for Glenn Greenwald, your threat model really is the NSA. Um, and that is a formidable, formidable adversary when it comes to protecting your sources. For other people, it might be as simple as uh, somebody sent by some criminal who doesn't like what you're writing about their operation to grab your laptop off of uh, the table while you're working uh, at a cafe, right? Um, and so I would argue that there are actually a lot of uh, simple steps that you can take that we can talk about, uh, namely encrypting your hard drive, um, certainly getting uh, encrypted email set up and using it, um, using either uh, VPNs or or other forms of anonymizing web traffic, and not for nefarious purposes, right? But if you do a Google search and it's then, you know, you're looking for something sensitive, you're working on a story, and you're ending up on the website of the very agency that you're reporting on, well, that's, there's a long text string of, you know, what, what, um, what you were looking for, uh, even without surveillance in sort of the, the middle uh, of that conversation. Um, so I think the most important thing is to be aware of what you're reporting on and who it might anger and who might be interested in your information and then working accordingly to build a, a threat model and a response that will actually protect you and allow you to continue to do your job both in terms of being efficient but also being able to do your job at all. How can journalists affect change here when you talk about that there's a restriction on the access to information and yet with the NSA reporters really it's difficult to know what exactly is going on there. So how do they educate the public about what's happening here and try to affect change in the government? You know, it's so traditional for journalists to um, uh, not want to draw attention to themselves. We're, we're the observers. Uh, and so it probably is necessary now <clears throat> to uh, you know, work on more stories about how this affects journalism, not just how it affects everybody else. Uh, it is probably necessary for uh, I mean, newspaper editorials, for bloggers in this space and others uh, to, uh, to draw attention to what's going on and to, uh, to advocate for change and to point out uh, what a danger this is. Um, it, uh, there's, there, there's nobody right now, for instance, who covers, who really covers this subject for the general public, as opposed to, the, as opposed to the Committee to Protect Journalists or the Reporters Committee for the Freedom of the Press, which are very active on behalf of journalists within the real world of journalists and officials. But there's not much in the way of. Of, uh, of doing journalism that reaches the general public about this subject, and there should there should probably be more of that. Uh, and the and the uh, and the other thing is, you know, just like in Washington, where um, when we think there's excessive. Uh, amounts of background information as opposed to people being on the record. If you stand up and say, I want this meeting to be on the record, there probably needs to be more individual activism by reporters uh, to, to say uh, what it is that worries them uh, about uh, interference with their ability to report and to speak out about it. Yeah, at a previous uh, conference, I was asked a very similar question, and I think it boils down to transparency and courage. As transparency about our own practices, um, who and and uh, potentially our biases, and also uh, how these issues affect us, and reporting in a way that's honest and um, and truthful and open and hard hitting. I mean, uh, this is the hundredth anniversary of Louis Brandeis saying that sunshine is said to be the greatest of disinfectants. That's what we do best as journalists. And I think it is uh, activism to do our jobs aggressively and uncover these programs. I mean, I was speaking, for example, to Peter Moss for my piece 
um, who interv interviewed Edward Snowden, who has worked on these issues, and um, he felt emboldened by this because the alternative is just the level of aggression that we're seeing now from DOJ, or worse, um, combined with an almost potentially irreversible uh, technological event horizon. I mean, once you get to a certain point, it's kind of hard to go back. One of the purposes of my report was to try to draw attention to the many different ways in which this administration has been so successfully controlling the message. Uh, including the ways we've talked about now and other ways, for instance, uh, um, uh, you know, reporting on itself, all these websites that, that they say shows that government's more open than ever before, but really amount to propaganda. It's, it's the information that the administration wants out about itself while it tries to prevent reporters from reporting on anything else. Uh, and my concern is it's so successful that the next administration is going to only want to do better. Uh, and, uh, and, and if, it's, if attention is not drawn, if the public does not understand the price that could be paid for not being able to hold government accountable. One of the things that I thought was so fascinating about both of your analysis is this whole conundrum that journalists face, particularly after 9-11, in terms of how much data do you reveal? Um, when you come across a treasure trove of confidential classified information, how do you strike a balance between informing the public but yet not releasing something that could be potentially harmful? Obviously, the media has been uh, doing this with the Snowden revelations. Uh, uh, he, he, he claims that he's, he has uh, not released to the reporters who are working on this information that he would knowingly, he would know that would be harmful to national security. But what goes on in the news organizations is that, first of all, this is very complex information. You've got to go through it very carefully to even understand what it's all about. And then you consult experts about it. Uh, and uh, to, to make sure that your understanding is clear. And among the questions you're asking them is, would publication be harmful to the country? And then you go to the government and you ask the government, you tell the government what you've got. You go to the NSA, you say, here's a story we have. You go to the White House, here's a story we have. Uh, and, uh, and, they, and the onus is on them to make the case that it would be harmful as opposed to embarrassing, politically difficult, whatever. So we went through this, for instance, when Dana Priest did the stories about the uh, some years ago about the CIA uh, secret prisons uh, in uh, some countries in, in the world outside the American legal system where terrorist suspects were, were rounded up and imprisoned and questioned aggressively, uh, some say court tortured. Um, and uh, it was, the story was pieced together. With, nobody gave us documents. Nobody gave Dana Priest documents. She was each a terrific reporter with great sources in the intelligence community. She gradually pieced the story together, one fact after one fact after one fact. And then she went to uh, the CIA and said, here's what I've, here's what I've learned. Uh, and the CIA obviously uh, asked, we don't publish that story. And she escalated it up. And, and to make a long story short, there was first a meeting at the CIA headquarters. Uh, with myself and some other editors and Dana, the reporter, and the uh, director of the CIA, Porter Goss, and the director of national intelligence, uh, in which they made their case. And I asked questions, what precisely would be harmful here? So uh, one possibility was they'd have to shut down the secret prisons once their, once their existence was revealed. Another possibility was that um, uh, the countries that were where these secret prisons were located, if they were named as the locations of them, and because their populations did not know this was going on there, uh, then that might topple that government, and the, or that government would have to de declare that it was no longer going to cooperate with the United States in any anti-terrorism efforts. And we knew about a lot of them that didn't raise the questions that the secret prisons raised we, that we wouldn't want to interrupt. So I listened carefully, and then we, and then the uh, the White House asked us to come there. I met with President Bush and Vice President Cheney, the National Security Advisor, uh, and they went over the same ground. And I asked the same questions. And so the conclusion I came to, you have to, you have to, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not in charge of national security. I can't make those decisions. But I had to be in charge of what goes in the Washington Post. They're not. That's that's just fundamental to being a newspaper editor. Uh, and so. Um, uh, uh, what I tried to figure out was what would really be harmful, potentially harmful to national security or human life. 
uh, and what would, what would not be. And what I decided was the worst thing that could happen by writing about the existence of the secret prisons and their purpose was that they'd have to be shut down and the uh, uh, terrorism suspects would have to be brought within the United States legal system at Guantanamo Bay, which in fact is what happened after we published. But on the other hand, I, I, thought, I decided that there would be too much harm caused, potential harm caused, to national security by naming the countries where they were located and therefore uh, interrupting the rest of the anti-terrorism cooperation that did not raise the legal and moral questions the secret prisons raised. After publication, of course, we were criticized by both sides. There were people that were very angry and critical of us for publishing anything about them, and there were people on the other side who were angry that we did not name the countries involved, but I felt comfortable with that decision. But that gives you an idea how we weigh things, how we consult thoroughly with the government, how we listen to them, we hear them out, and then we have to make a decision. I think the only thing that I could possibly add to that is that, uh, as you can see, <laughs> journalists and editors take these matters seriously. And uh, the press is not an arm of the government. The press is independent. And it's clear that in the past uh, and in the present that, that the news media uh, takes its obligations seriously, soberly, and tries to be responsible, and I think does a very good job of that. Um, and governments will probably always make the argument that something is uh, harmful and should not be published. Um, perhaps sometimes it's true, oftentimes it's not as true as uh, they may be uh, arguing. I mean, you can look to the Pentagon Papers, for example. Um, the only prior restraint sought by the Department of Justice in American history and was essentially just embarrassing. Um, and yet the government not only made the argument, but, but actually made it in court and tried to stop publication of the Post, of the Times. Um, and so it, it's as much our responsibility to be careful as it is to be careful about what we're being told by government officials. Len, you talked in your report about how there's a trickle-down effect here in terms of uh, chilling sources from talking with reporters. And someone else in the report also made an interesting comment about how the administration practices sort of this slow stall in handing out information and they don't get back with folks. Did you see any proof that this type of behavior is impacting not only national security stories, but other types of more innocuous stories? Yes, ab absolutely. We've been talking about national security most of the time now, but this is affecting all coverage of the government. Uh, for instance, the agencies that have the worst records uh, in response to interview requests or FOI requests are agencies that deal with uh, uh, public health, with food safety, with a whole variety of other things in the government. Uh, with the EPA, for instance, uh, has a terrible record of, of, uh, of, resp of not responding to freedom of information requests and interview requests uh, about information. So the, it definitely permeates the entire administration. And a recent survey conducted by the Associated Press Managing Editors of newspaper editors around the country showed that they not only are finding that the federal government is harder to cover than ever before, but this is a trickle down to state and local governments, uh, which is, again, that's our fear is that this will become the new normal. Uh, so they, they see that the, the federal administration get, get away with it. We get away with it, too. So they're, they're slowing down on their response to freedom of information requests. Uh, they're being uh, 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 more difficult about interviews, and they're using their websites to put out propaganda rather than information people can use. Yeah, which just harms the, the actual flow of truthful information uh, that should be out there. I mean, their side is uh, something that I think the press wants to publish and compare and weigh, and that's not happening. Um, the other thing I would add is that in terms of trickle down from a uh, digital security point of view, which we haven't quite touched on yet um, in, in sort of depth, but um, you know, it's not just the national security reporters uh, who have to be worried about this kind of surveillance. First of all, as I sort of alluded to, uh, there are many threats, whether it's organized crime, whether it's uh, foreign governments, um, or whether it's the US government trying to uh, further its, an investigation. Um, 
whether or not the journalist is the target of the investigation, they can still end up in federal prison for civil contempt, um, you know, as James Rison is being, being threatened, uh, you know, pretty much as we speak. But the other thing I want to mention is how easily you can be working on something that then becomes much bigger than you expected. So say you're a student journalist or you're just out of J school and you're reporting on, um, I don't know, there's, say that there's a local Air Force base or something, right? Um, and somebody gets entrepreneurial and, and starts, I'm just making this up, but uh, you know, this is why I do it at Berkeley, I make up hypotheticals, but you know, somebody sells some um, M4s to a local crime lord, I don't know, something like that. Um, and you're kind of looking into it and you know, maybe you're, you're more interested in the local angle um, and then all of a sudden you're being questioned by military investigators or the FBI, right? Um, or even uh, there was a case where I, a firm I used to work handled a case where it was a investigation into a conscientious objector who, um, and then the military investigators actually went and uh, tried to get unpublished work product from the local reporter. Or say you're reporting on your local city council, that's all you do, right? Or you're reporting on your local sheriff and in comes um, a corruption investigation or a civil rights investigation Whatever it is, things can very quickly get much bigger than you might expect. And so being careful about your sources all the time is particularly important when you don't know when things can um, blow up into a national story, a federal investigation, um, anger somebody in a foreign intelligence service, et cetera. Okay, I think we'd like to take questions from the audience now. Uh, we have someone with a microphone here, so if you want to raise your hand, she can come around and pick up your question. Somebody go first. Don't be shy. Peter, back there. Hi, right, guys. Oh, thanks for being here. Um, I have a question primarily directed to Mr. King, and I don't quite know how to phrase it, but there are third parties that are also involved now in, in digital surveillance. Um, there is a, a company or a group somewhere in Norway, I know that's uh, called FinFisher, is doing some uh, digital surveillance of people in, in the African diaspora or of citizens uh, of a country and kind of contracting this work out to governments, to governments, let's say. And my question is, could the United States at some point contract this work out and therefore be able to sort of uh, hide it better if there's a way to hide it better than the NSA does, which would be really be pretty hard. Um, and what can you comment about that? Yeah, well, I mean, the, the, the NSA and the FBI and um, you know, probably DIA and, and lots of agencies have uh, dedicated hacking teams of their own that are very, very good. I mean, they're really good. And, um, you know, uh, Bruce Schneier, who's a, a, a very prominent technologist, has said, you know, the NSA wants to own you. They're going to own you um, from a targeted point of view. And, you know, I, I would argue that that's, it's, if the, the targets are appropriate, um, that kind of targeted surveillance, it's going to be very different from mass surveillance, right? They can uh, pull in journalists, their sources, and everybody else. I'm not sure that, that the, um, the contracting out is uh, necessarily the, the crux of it, but certainly there is targeted hacking. So I'll give you an actual example. Um, as reported by Der Spiegel, based on the Snowden documents, the NSA hacked Al Jazeera. Um, how many people knew that, by the way? Yeah, it, right? And, and well, you work with me. Um, you have to read it. Yeah, they hacked an internal encrypted uh, Al Jazeera communications network, according to Der Spiegel. Um, you know, my piece talks about, uh, there, there are several examples of... Um, 
Well, Edward Snowden said that the Laura Poitras is under surveillance, and so um, I think that whatever the whatever the threat is coming from, whatever direction, um, what's important is to be taking basic prudent steps against a for-profit company or a bored teenager or a powerful state actor as best you can. And I think that's more the idea is to get everybody up to a certain level, um, which creates a culture of, of uh, people being careful about uh, their work product and their sources. And, and this reminds me to remind all of you what I tell my students all the time. Uh, which is you need to be very careful about what you do in digital space if you intend to be a journalist because uh, you're compiling a permanent record uh, even in snapchats uh, even in emails back and forth even in texts back and forth uh, that doesn't go away it never goes away don't believe any any provider that tells you that uh, you know you can disappear this thing it's always going to be there and the people we're talking about are very sophisticated so 20 years from now you can be in a position as a journalist you're doing very important and very sensitive work, and somebody's going to find something in your past to use against you that could be a big problem for your work. So you need to be extremely careful. We're talking about government intrusion into your privacy. There's private intrusion into your privacy every single day, to which most of us voluntarily agree to. If we go on Facebook, if we use Twitter, uh, if we use social media of all different kinds, we are voluntarily giving up some of our privacy. When we Google something, it's not just the NSA that's watching us, it's Google that's watching us, and then there's selling that information to other people. So it's, I guess it's okay when, for instance, I was, uh, my wife and I were planning on going to a, a certain hotel uh, not long ago, and we, so I wanted to look up that hotel in order to check out whether that's the place we want to stay. And for days afterwards, wherever I went on the internet, ads for that hotel showed up. So my, you know, that's, 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 that's hacking too. That's my privacy being invaded. Now, that's not a terribly big problem, but it is a big problem if you compile, if you, if you are putting out into the digital world any information that can be used against you later. That does mean if you want to be a journalist, you're gonna to have to behave differently than other people uh, because uh, your, your permit record is, is a, has a different value than somebody else's. Hello, my name is Javeria Tareen and I'm from Pakistan. I'm a journalist. The recent story which uh, is also available on CPG uh, website, it's regarding the journalist who got uh, threatened by the militant group. And my, rec uh, rec uh, my question is with you, Mr. King. Um, living in a uh, United States and covering NSA and the delegation also went to meet uh, Pakistani Prime Minister from the CPG, um, organization where they ensured and they asked the prime minister to uh, give uh, journalists of the freedom of expression and then when they leak some story you know people they threat them and they beat them or they kill them especially in Pakistan and then how we can promote in this scenario where you are going and asking the government of Pakistan to help the journalists to come up with the freedom of expression and speech and then uh, you are dealing with NSA don't you think there is a double standard on it when it comes to Pakistan or when we deal with a uh, United States, how you will comment on that? Thank you so much. So uh, our first comprehensive report on the United States was actually uh, the one that we're talking about now. Uh, much of our work has been international, uh, almost all of it has been international until recently. Um, we, uh, uh, we report on abuses all over the world. We have regional teams with regional experts who are working on um, events as they occur. Um, my work on surveillance and censorship is uh, not just about the NSA, that's just what we're talking about tonight, but um, Pakistan has a new cybercrime bill that's coming up um, that has some very problematic provisions. I've written about uh, India's CRM, uh, Central, I'm sorry, CMS, Central Management System, um, and that's up on the CPJ internet blog. Um, recently been writing a lot about Turkey and what's been going on there. Um, Brazil, so uh, you know, sort of our work is never done, um, and and there are different, uh, as I said, threat models for journalists in different parts of the world, and it's um, it's very true that the United States has uh, robust First Amendment protections um, for journalists, but um, I think that relative to those protections, what we've seen recently has been 
there's been a very stark difference, but we're certainly engaged all over the world um, and will continue to be. Hi, my name is Stephanie Guzman, and my question is for all three of you. Um, it's becoming more common now that uh, the media is using drones, um, and it's becoming more mainstream around the world. And of course, it came with mixed reactions. Some people feel it's the future of journalism. Some people feel that it's invasion of privacy. So I just, my question is for all of you, what is your thoughts on it? Do you feel, is it just another attack on journalism or, or it's something positive? Uh, I'm not in the Washington Post newsroom every day anymore, but I'm not aware of our ever using a drone. I don't think we own a drone. I don't think we've had any uh, use of, with a drone. Uh, I think the first media concerns about drones have to do with television because it, it enables your cameras, obviously, to take pictures that they might not otherwise be able to take, uh, particularly if it's uh, you know, airspace where you can't put a helicopter up and drones are cheaper than helicopters. And I think we're going to be seeing some real issues involved in that, not just privacy issues, but safety issues. Uh, uh, commercial drones have already crashed uh, in the people's yards and stuff, and so they're, they could be a real danger. Uh, but that's that's all I know about them. I, I think that is. I think the they're clearly going to be used increasingly in the future by everybody uh, for, for various reasons, including the media. And I think there'll be real issues about privacy and safety that will arise. Yeah, and, and the FAA is in the process of um, you know, as I'm sure you know, of of putting together guidelines on the use of drones, um, including for commercial purposes. Um, and I think they can be very useful, right? I mean, during the, the Gezi Park protest, there was a drone that was uh, allegedly shot down by the security services, um, but it was showing uh, some pretty incredible footage. Recently, there was a large fire in San Francisco where I live and somebody, uh, I think just some private citizen, flew a drone and got uh, footage that showed the extent of the damage that really wasn't able to be captured from the ground. So I think that um, you know they can be used for um, wonderful news gathering purposes, but obviously there are there are privacy and safety issues to deal with. I actually just did a story last week about an ordinance in a tiny town in Colorado called Deer Trail, where they voted on whether or not they should be allowed to shoot down drones in the town airspace, which was all of a mile square. And the ordinance actually got voted down. Uh, so, but I think it's a good example of the fact that you do have a lot of municipalities and state governments looking at uh, putting into place public policy that will regulate drone use um, on top of whatever the FAA comes up with. So this issue is going to intensify next year as the FAA guidelines come out, but we already see states and cities taking action on this. Uh, would you say that the, I guess, like attack on the press is a trend, or is it like an effect of the of this current administration, or yeah, is it like a, the new wave of, of governments around the world? When I asked Bob Schieffer uh, if this was the most uh, uh, controlling administration he had ever seen, he said his answer to that question always is the current one is, and that's exactly what's going on. You know, each each administration learns from the one in the past. Occasionally, there are administrations that are not very successful at it. The Carter administration comes to mind. Uh, but those who have been successful at it, the Reagan administration, the Clinton administration less so also because it, what require, it requires a strong central control. The, Car the uh, Reagan administration had that. Uh, the Bush administration had that. And the Obama administration had that. Uh, relatively tight central control by the White House over, uh, over the relationships uh, with the press. Uh, but as I say, I think this works so well, first of all, in both campaigns, in both Obama's campaigns, use the same message control. Uh, and, uh, and the fact that they now think it works really well in governing, I believe, will lead uh, 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 future administrations of both parties to try to replicate it. And the question is whether or not you're good enough to be able to keep that control or whether it will break down. I guess I would also add that the... Um the fact that, as the, the First Circuit Court of Appeals said, in a case called Glick v. Cunifee, um, that a blogger sitting at her, I'm paraphrasing, but a blogger sitting at her computer can break a story um, 
you know, and it's just as likely uh, as a um, major news organization. Maybe not just as likely, but uh, just in terms of resources. But um, that is something that's very new, and I think that that worries governments uh, quite a bit. And um, that what you will see and what we are seeing is governments cracking down on people who don't have major institutional backing. Of course, that's also, um, it also plays into how the news media is changing. Um, even traditionally, uh, journalists are traditionally attached to major organizations or finding themselves freelancing. And so uh, people don't have the same kind of institutional backing. And I think the governments will take advantage of that um, in some cases in really horrific uh, and violent ways, in other cases more subtle ways. I mean, I, you know, the United States, um, we've seen, for example, uh, the prosecution of Barrett Brown for sharing a link to information that was uh, sought, or that was, that was um, there's a hack of, of a, a private intelligence contractor. You know, it was by, the hack was by somebody else. He got a hold of it. He'd written for Vanity Fair and The Guardian. He found himself facing 45 years um, for acts in connection with possessing and publishing the information contained in that link. Now, the US Department of Justice rightfully dropped almost all of those charges. Um, but I think that you will see increasing targeting of cases where uh, governments feel that they can take advantage of either an unclear status or, or um, a lack of financial and institutional backing. We have time for one or two questions. Sorry about that. Hi, my name is Sarah Jarvis. Um, I was wondering if there is any recent legislation in the United States at any government level regarding protection of information in light of these advancing technologies that we should be aware of, and if not, do you see that happening in the future? For protection of information? Is it, uh, okay. Well, there, there, there is a pending in Congress a shield law. But most states in the Union uh, have, a, uh, have shield laws uh, that in varying ways uh, will protect reporters from being coerced by the government to uh, reveal confidential sources or confidential information. There is no such law, and there's no such federal law. So if, you're, if it's a federal investigation that's involved, uh, there's no law to protect reporters in a similar way. Uh, there is now a shield law that's been negotiated by various representatives of the news media and members of Congress uh, that has passed the Senate Justice Committee, but I think that's as far as it's gone so far. I don't know if it's made it to the Senate floor. And there's a companion bill in the House, but it's not as good a bill, so I don't know if, I don't know if it's going to pass or not. There are some questions about this, which Jeff may want to address. One is whether or not in order to have a federal shield law, the government of the United States would be defining who's a journalist, who's protected by it. They've tried to finesse that by not using the word journalist at all in the, in the, in the draft that passed the Senate, passed the Senate Justice Committee, uh, by, um, uh, by, by defining who's covered by the law as opposed to saying who's a journalist. I, I, I think that's a helpful uh, finesse, but there's still people that are concerned about that. And then the other big concern is there's, a, once again, a huge national security exemption. So if you're engaged in national security reporting, you probably won't be covered by it at all. I still think it's a useful thing to have passed because there's all kinds of other reporting that goes on where federal investigations are seeking your sources, like reporting on crimes, for example. And, and if that would protect those reporters from what's, gonna ha what's happening to James Risen, uh, that would still be useful, even though it wouldn't cover national security. Yeah, I think CPJ's position would just be that we would favor uh, the broadest possible definitions of uh, who's a journalist. Um, we deal with people all over the world who they are journalists and their governments consider them criminals or terrorists. Sometimes they don't even recognize um, their own journalistic activities as such. They feel like perhaps they're engaged in a form of activism because that's kind of the nicest thing that you could manage to say about yourself in that situation. Um, so uh, we would favor just the broadest protections possible. There are other examples of, of bills that um, come at it from different angles than, than just the shield law that are also, I think, things to watch, um, not necessarily taking a, a position on them. Um, but there, has been, uh, there have been moves toward anti-SLAPP 
legislation at the federal level to protect, um, uh, to provide a procedural mechanism for um, getting rid of civil lawsuits quickly that infringe on free speech. Um, there, is, there are moves to reform the Electronic Communications Privacy Act, which was passed in 1986, and that is what governs searches and seizures of um, electronic communications that are held by third parties, for example. Um, so there are a number of, of various important issues that are just sort of bubbling up. Um, export controls, you know, the idea that you can't export um, uh, antivirus software or it's difficult to get uh, word processing software into the hands of people who might be living under a regime where it would actually be very helpful to um, even U.S. interests to have that uh, that capability in the hands of regular people. And I think all of these things are, are uh, interesting and complex issues and ones that will be um, bubbling to the surface. There are also recently. things that the American government and in fact the Obama administration in its remaining two years can do, and which I recommended that they do in my report. Uh, one is to f fulfill the president's promise to, uh, to, to not classify so much government information. He has on his, on his desk, as we say colloquially, uh, he, he has in front of him recommendations from a commission that he asked Congress to create. Uh, that makes recommendations for, uh, that would greatly reduce the amount of unnecessary classification of government information. He could act on those recommendations if he chooses to. He doesn't need an act of Congress. He also, they also issued an order to all the government agencies to be much more responsive to Freedom of Information Act requests. And they've not, they've not taken the trouble to find out that that is not really being followed by most agencies. And he could do that and he could order them to shape up. Uh, so there are things that can still be done by this administration. And I would hope that the president would want his legacy to be, in fact, that he did create a more open government than he, than he found, uh, and uh, as opposed to leaving a more closed government, which some of us are going to note uh, when his administration's over if he doesn't act uh, differently. And I would just add, um, on the Internet front, uh, he also formed a White House review group of people he knows pretty well. And I think maybe there might have been some surprise about uh, just how, uh, how I mean, they took their job very seriously. I'll put it that way. Uh, there are 47 recommendations. Really substantively, when, he, uh, when President Obama gave his speech about NSA reform, he touched on less than half a dozen of them, really. Um, so things like stockpiling zero-day exploits, meaning you find a bug in, um, in SSL encryption or in Microsoft Word or, or uh, in PDF documents, there's a bounty now and governments, including ours, are paying top dollar and they're stockpiling these things um, so they can be used as offensive weapons. Well, what does that do? It's like a giant game of Jenga with the internet. You're p taking it apart piece by piece and making it less and less stable and you know it's not just um, U.S. intelligence agencies or the other ones that are paying for these that are potentially going to be able to find these, thing, find these things and, um, and exploit them. Um, you know, mass surveillance creates problems of security, privacy, free speech. Um, and so, you know, the president could take that White House Review Group report more seriously as well. On an end note, uh, what would you both say that if this issue with access to information and then the issue with surveillance aren't brought under control or, or further exposed, what sort of example does that set for foreign countries where the United States is trying to supposedly set the example that we're more open right. and accessible? Good point. And that's, of course, what the Committee to Protect Journalists is all about. And also, um, there's a group in Washington, an informal group of people involved in government transparency who are concerned about this. They note the fact that on the, on the good side of the ledger for this administration, it has been very active in trying to increase openness in other governments around the world uh, with some success in some places. The problem is if uh, uh, the, this administration does not show more openness and more transparency, what kind of example does that set to those governments that so far has been preaching successfully too? Uh, and so that would be my concern about that. Yeah, I'll give a concrete example. Um, it was previously the case that uh, the countries that were calling for mandatory data localization um, of internet 
traffic data were China, Iran, um, places that have terrible, terrible track records on uh, internet freedom. After the Snowden revelations, it's been places like Germany and Brazil um, because they are concerned about uh, US actions, among others, at least this is the publicly stated rationale, um, and make the claim that localizing the data will, meaning making sure that there are, there are local servers on which Google has to, or Facebook has to put its data, um, that this will protect from foreign espionage. Now, that's not actually very true. Um, the NSA is gonna get to that data, and there have been arguments that it actually makes it easier, and that there might be other motivations, but the point is that uh, US policy choices have made things worse for internet freedom and have given cover to some really bad ideas that could basically break the interconnectedness of the internet itself. Um, and now it's not just uh, countries that we can, that the US government can point to as being historically bad on uh, internet freedom, but it's now um, getting sort of a patina of legitimacy. And that worries me a great deal. I felt pretty happy coming into this discussion, but Jeff has really yeah, depressed I'm me. Sorry. <laughs> Lots of food for thought. Thank you for joining us. Thank you.